morning. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce my colleague Rémi Duty this morning, who will talk both to people who are present in this room, uh, we have a few, and to those of you who are at home and following us in a virtual mode. Today is the first time we meet for our new Seminaire d'équipe, which will be a time for the members of PIMA, both to showcase their current research topics and to welcome other colleagues from different departments and or different universities. The choice we made as a team was to allow our different points of focus to gain some visibility, power of the minor mode, intermedial research, and the third line, which is transmission, memory, and legacy. Um, now I'm going to introduce our colleague, René Duty, who has worked on the politics and uh, symbolic politics of the 1790s, with articles on feminism, radicalism, and symbols like the guillotine. Along with Laurence Marché, another member of Clima, the two of us are currently editing the proceedings of a day conference on sociability and democratic practices in early 19th century Britain to be published in June this year. Rémy is also working on a book on British celebrations of foreign revolutions from 1789 to 1848. This includes the French Revolution and its representation in British culture. Today's talk is linked to this project and here is the title of Rémy's talk the intermediate reception of two French revolutionary songs, Saïra and the Carmagnole in Britain, from 1789 to Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Magali, for, for this kind uh, presentation. Um, so, uh, Saïra and the Carmagnole, alongside the Marseillaise, constitute the musical heritage of the French Revolution for most people. Many songs, often topical and ephemeral, were sung in that stormy period, but they are now forgotten. Why the Marseillaise and in Britain, God Save the King and other uh, lesser known songs like Britain's Strike Home have been the object of critical study. Little is known of the international uh, reception of Saira and the Carmagnol. This paper is partly an attempt to remedy this situation, offering a case study in the international, in this case cross-channel, uh, reception of two songs. I came across uh, those songs during my, my uh, work on this uh, book I'm writing on uh, British celebrations of, uh, of foreign revolutions. And uh, what I found fascinating about Saira in particular is the variety of conversations, allusions, art forms and objects, artifacts, which, which could use this song as a metonym for the French Revolution. Saira was sung, but also written on graphic caricatures, objects. It was quoted in letters and pamphlets through different media forms. And so in this paper, I suggest that Saira especially, uh, but also the Carmagnol to a lesser extent, had a capacity for immediately signifying revolution, and as such, uh, their use closely followed revolutionary or counter-revolutionary uh, uh, affiliation. Uh, so, th so this was my slide for the, uh, for the introduction. Uh, sorry for the delay. Um, uh, the Carmagnol uh, originated in, uh, in an Italian round dance and it became popular around the time of the storming of the Tuileries in August 1792. Authorship of words and music is unknown. Somewhat more is known about Saira, though it is also largely a song of anonymous collective origin. The original Saira was a, a ditty, a song in favor of Lafayette, uh, expressing wishes of harmony and uh, peace when it became popular in the summer of 1790 during the preparations for the uh, Festival of the Federation. Uh, at, at a moment when the revolution seemed to be smiling and stabilizing. So it was hardly a revolutionary song, but new versions, parodies, and adaptations to more violent times soon emerged. By the spring of 1791, the famous burden, Les Aristocrates à la Lanterne, about hanging aristocrats to the lampposts, um, were, uh, were on the Parisians' lips. So the most famous uh, rendition of uh, Saira in French culture is probably Edith Piaf in Si Versailles Mette Comte, and I'm trying to play, to play this. Okay, so I'm absolutely sorry about that. So basically in uh, Si Versailles uh, Mette Comte, a film from the mid uh, 1950s, um, you can uh, see uh, uh, 
Edith Piaf heading uh, a crowd of men and uh, women at the uh, gilded gates, uh, banging at the gilded gates of uh, the palace in uh, Versailles, and Piaf sings the um, the song. So I'm I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not going to to singing myself, but basically this, the uh, lyric that she sings are uh, a partly historical, partly a uh, modern version. Uh, and they are a, a sure sign of the, the malleability of the song, its adaptability to changes of moods and political watchwords. The scene corresponds to the French memory of Seyrat, the role of women, the gender element is central uh, to that memory as women were at the forefront of riots on the streets. The British memory of Sarah was also gendered, but this time it bore on the negative, transgressive presence of unwomanly women in the public space. Uh, the women would be horrid hags, rather than the bright-faced, uh, pretty women that we see in the uh, uh, Sasha Guitry uh, movie. If I'm not mistaken, the scene represented in the film is the, the October days of October 1789, uh, when the Parisians marched to Versailles to bring back uh, the king and the uh, uh, royal family as prisoners into Paris. But we know that the women did not sing Saira on, on that occasion. They sang another song called Vive Henri IV, a song of love and loyalty to a good king. And it's a fact that must be elided from the standard French Republican narrative of 1789 because it was a, a monarchical song in a way. In 1789, the English also knew about Vive Henri IV. At least uh, Helen Maria Williams did. She was a witness and a travel writer that I will tell you more uh, later. So this shows that memory has been very selective and retained only a handful of songs from the rich revolutionary repertoire. The scene from the 1954 movie um, is, is interesting. It reminds us of, uh, of the tune, of course, but it, it also shows uh, partially similar and partially divergent uh, memories of Seyra in France and uh, Britain. Now, a few words about intermediality, perhaps, uh, because this is the first um, uh, session in this uh, seminar series. Uh, so intermediality, which is part of the um, research perspectives of the um, group uh, Klima. Uh, specialists of the 18th and 19th century are not very familiar with the word intermediality. It's a concept that informs much research on contemporary media. It's very 20th, late 20th, 21st century. Paul Pickering, in a study on the political uses of uh, God Save the King, notes the transmediality of songs, uh, which is understood as their availability uh, across multiple uh, platforms at the same time as slip songs, radical newspapers, songsters, uh, etc. So this was true of, of Sayra and the Carmanuel, because those those different media gave access to their tunes and lyrics so they could be found across different, different media. But there is more. Other specialists, especially Peter Wagner, uh, Frédéric Auger, have used the word intermediality to study the relationships between text and image. For instance, in uh, Hogarth or Gilray, the intertextuality between novels and um, uh, visual caricature. In keeping with recent uh, research on forms of orality, music and dance, uh, for instance, John Mee's work on conversation, Paul Pickering and Kate Bowen on songs, studies of soundscapes and dance, I'd like to explore the interplay between um, music, dance and sense, and the use of Sarah uh, um, across many oral, written and visual forms. So this ranges from the everyday mundane to the elaborate and the artistic, from intimate practices to public uh, performances. Seira became a tag, um, a slogan, uh, it transferred from media to media. Um, it was a slogan that British, Irish and Americans remembered easily and that they used in a variety of contexts and media, even as interjection in, in, in talk. 
So this is what I mean in this paper by intermediality, the transfer of the phrase in the theatre, toasting, in print, in graphic caricature. The circulation of the French tag, which became synonymous with the French Revolution and took on various shades of meaning, both positive and increasingly negative. I think the phrase was so successful because it was easy to spell. Uh, it was also easy to say for English people like Saïra, whereas Carmagnol would be uh, more difficult. Marseillaise is perhaps even worse with those R's and those diphthongs. So uh, Saïra was, um, was simple. And another reason whether the French national anthem, the Marseillaise, had lyrics which were loaded with ideology. From the start, it was a literary song with uh, lyrics which were extremely ideologically uh, loaded, and that made the song less malleable for parody and, and, and appropriation. So I'd like to, to compare shortly the Marseillaise and, and, and Saira, and perhaps to wink at uh, another uh, research topic of climat, uh, puissance du mode mineur or power in minor mode and I, I'd like to suggest perhaps that Saïra is the minor of the Marseillaise which would be its major uh, counterpart. Laura Mason, the historian of French revolutionary songs, wrote that Roger de Lille, uh, the, the composer, Roger de Lille reputedly produced his hymn in a single night after hearing uh, the mayor of, of Strasbourg and other local elites complain that Saira and La Carmagnole were vulgar songs unfit for proper soldiers. So the Marseillaise had a proper pedigree, an author, certified lyrics, even a date of birth, uh, while Saira and the Carmagnole emerged from the crowds uh, uh, as orphans at an unknown date and place. Neither of those songs had a proper author, um, so they were absolutely popular, except for, for Saira for a very short time in England. It was taken by aristocrats for perhaps a couple of months, but other than that, it was absolutely um, popular. The Marseillaise was major, linked to the state, its institution, the army, officialdom. And Saira and the Communion were street urchins, minor songs in that respect, and very difficult songs to defend in the early 19th century. Interestingly, uh, historians have studied them less than the Marseillaise, and I've um, shown you on the uh, right-hand side, Les Lieux de Mémoire, uh, Realms of Memory, which is, of course, a prestigious uh, historiographical collection which devotes one uh, big chapter to the Marseillaise, while the other revolutionary songs are absent. Uh, while Saira uh, could be quaint and harmless in the early stages of the revolution, by 1793, they, uh, it symbolized uh, the ruthless, destructive energy of the sans uh, It served to figure the initial enthusiasm of the revolution and the disgusting, ignoble crimes of the mob, the unrespectable parts of the revolution, as I write it, abject with um, question mark. Uh, I'm not a proper literary person. If I were a critic literary, I would say uh, clever things about Julia Kristeva and the, and the abject, but I'm afraid I can't at this point. So, so I'm just... <laughs> Um, perhaps the public will have some, <laughs> some takes on that, uh, on, on, on that part. Um, yes, so, so, so the idea of the disgusting, ignoble, abject, uh, irrecoverable part of the uh, revolution. While the Marseillaise represented the lofty ideals of the state, and typically the part that the Girondins wanted to reclaim, they accepted 1789 while rejecting the crimes of the terror in 1793, and I think that's important for Dickens and the, and the rest of the presentation. So I'd like to um, discuss the evolution of Saira from harmless song to um, war cry of the sans-culotte sans and show some of the intermediate representations in, uh, in, in Britain, especially in visual caricature. 
I have a second perspective, which I think I will shorten a, a little bit because it's different from intermediality. It's more about the song as a pragmatic uh, text, the illocutory force, uh, a song that is made to frighten the conservatives in Britain and, and France, a song whose importance really lies in, the, in its uh, power to frighten. And finally, I will discuss uh, Carlyle, uh, Thomas Carlyle and, and, and Charles Dickens. So the Song of Joy uh, at the Festival of the Federation. So this is an engraving, a French engraving, showing uh, uh, the, the, the kind of um, rosy uh, vision of the uh, early stages of the, uh, of the French Revolution during the uh, preparations for the Festival of the Federation. Uh, when even uh, ladies uh, took up uh, spades and uh, did some uh, spade work to, uh, to, to, to prepare for the uh, decoration of the uh, Festival of the Federation, the 14th of July, 1790. The uh, song uh, was played on the London theatres. There was a spate of plays on the Federation with uh, theatrical managers trying to recreate, to reenact uh, the uh, Federation and sometimes they reenacted the fall of the Bastille as well with grandiose um, uh, decorations and Sarah was an heir uh, that, was, uh, that was expected. Londoners could buy the libretto which would include the lyrics and the score for the uh, harpsichord which I find interesting because the harpsichord was of course an aristocratic or um, middle class uh, instruments, so you could play Saira in your drawing room if you were a Whig um, aristocrat in the autumn of 1790. Uh, Helen Maria Williams, uh, who was a keen observer of French realities, also propagated the notion of Saira as a jaunty song of a revolutionary reconciliation. Her letters written in France, uh, you have the uh, reference uh, at the bottom of the first volume, there are eight volumes in total. Uh, I, I realize that I uh, gave you quite a, a hefty uh, passage. Uh, basically what uh, Williams um, describes is the uh, theater in Paris. So between the acts, national songs are played in which the whole audience join in chorus. And there's one air in particular which has become a favorite called the Carillon National, and the burden of the song is Saira. It's sung at every theater, in every, in every street of Paris, in every town and village of France by man, woman, and child. It's the signal of pleasure. And she notes that political discussions are usually punctuated by people saying Saira. So she saw that there was uh, this kind of, um, of um, gradual blending from Saira, which is uh, something as common as bonjour or merci, oui Saira, merci, uh, into the revolutionary song. So it's absolutely uh, everywhere. And, she, uh, and it expresses e easygoing confidence in the revolution's outcome. In later volumes, uh, this is from 1792. Uh, Helen Maria Williams also mentioned the, the uh, song uh, several times, and she wrote vivid vignettes of Parisian festive uh, life. I like this word, vignette. It's a kind of key word in this presentation because uh, English um, uh, writers of narrative prose at the time, they, they, they loved to present the plantings of trees of liberty as a vineyard, a kind of self-contained small scene. And one, of, and one of those which I have shortened here, she says that um, on Sunday last, the tree of liberty was planted with great rejoicings in the middle of the square in which we live. Uh, the people formed the most picturesque group, picturesque, so she's a bit like Lawrence uh, Stern and Tristram Shandy. She's just uh, walking around and looking at things and she sees a picturesque monk, a picturesque uh, dairy maid or whatever. So they formed a picturesque group and there was something in the scene that gave me an idea of the simplicity of ancient times. The people danced with all their hearts and souls. So 
the song partakes of the spirit of ideal civic communication, uh, celebrating the rule of law. Uh, it's, it's a quotation from Elizabeth uh, Balls from Women, Travel Writers and the Language of Aesthetics. And so the festival is aestheticized as a self-contained unit and it presents the revolution as a kind of, uh, dr of dream um, dreamt up by uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a prelude to democratic uh, government. But for me, Williams's composition, the vignette, is also significant for another reason, because it, it, of course it serves to beautify popular joy, but it also frames it and contains it. Uh, it contains popular agency, as if she feared the panoramic tableau. There are very few big tableaus, as you find in Dickens, in, um, in The Tale of Two Cities, with this oceanic crowd uh, rushing forth, etc. She sees the people in, in, in small um, vineyards doing nice, uh, pretty things, uh, which is a way, perhaps, of containing a popular agency. Uh, so this is a representation of, of singing around the tree of liberty as there existed so, so many uh, at the time. And this contrasted with another vision of the crowd at the Civic Festival, public in, in, in the Manchester Herald in April 1792. Uh, it is inspired by two English radicals who had gone to Paris to liaise with the Jacobins. So this was written by people who are very uh, committed to, to, to democracy con compared with Williams who was much more elitist and they described 50,000 people dancing at Walt to Syrah I heard 100,000 voices cry out uh, vive les anglais uh, etc uh, I was wit witness to sentiments from the mouth of the multitude and this uh, finally is a, a lasting monument of the virtue of the people when left to the honest effusion of their own sentiments and unshackled by the satellites of despotism. So this time uh, the representation is much more democratic than in Williams in the sense that the narrator, an English lover of the French Revolution, immerses himself in the immense crowd. He's not a kind of outside spectator like Williams. And though he is still a spectator, I saw, uh, he does not contain the revolutionary activity, but imagines its cosmopolitan reach, encompassing even the, uh, the English. So, uh, Saira became a way of showing ideological goodwill in uh, diplomatic play, diplomatic exchanges between uh, the two countries, especially during visits uh, across the, the Channel. In August 1790, France, uh, Francais and Bougon, who were two delegates from the Nantes Jacobin Club, were visiting London. They had been invited by, um, um, by the Whigs, and they were uh, treated as guests of honour by Lord Stanhope, a Whig uh, lord in his uh, country house, and they and they remember Madame Sheridan, so she would be the, wise, the wife of Richard Brinsley Sheridan, the, the Irish playwright who was also a Whig politician. Madame Sheridan, une des plus belles femmes d'Angleterre, nous a chanté avec sa sœur, sa compagnon du clavecin, des chansons patriotiques et françaises. So again, you can see how in 1790, Whig uh, ladies could uh, sing French tunes like probably Saira, he doesn't say it, but this kind of tune was perfectly uh, acceptable in the upper reaches of the, of the nobility, in fashionable drawing rooms. Uh, and, and, and of course, the, this has been uh, largely forgotten. Um, caricaturists used the word uh, Saira as a convenient tag to uh, signify revolution, uh, as I said. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure you can see see very much Saira, but it, it, it's like the play of the uh, uh, Seven Errors. Uh, Saira is written somewhere in, in, this, um, in this plate, Mr. Burke's pair of spectacles for short-sighted politicians. So it's a, a caricature of Edmund Burke's criticism of uh, English friends of, of the revolution. And uh, here, 
uh, this this appears here uh, uh, around the character of Richard Brinsley Sheridan, whose wife played uh, Sarah on the harpsichord, and he's uh, uh, saying uh, Sarah while uh, playing um, an extinguisher, the kind of which are used in uh, theatres. So here there's an emphasis on orality and on, on uh, people uh, bella bellowing out slogans in a very dramatic, uh, dramatic way. Of course, Sheridan was um, a playwright. Um, slide 14, uh, Rowlandson, it's one among many that could have been chosen. A detail from Rowlandson's philosophy run mad or a stupendous monument of human wisdom. This is a quotation by Charles James Fox, who was uh, another of those uh, Whigs, uh, Whig friends of the French Revolution. And here you see um, philosophy uh, claiming uh, Sarah. Uh, on top of, of, of a pile of truncated columns, uh, reading law, community, uh, etc. So Saira is like the, the, the acme, the uh, epitome of uh, philosophy run, run mad. And, and of course this is where the slogan uh, works well, because it's very short, so you can put it in a speech bubble and everyone... Uh, understood it in, in, in Britain. Um, a different take on, on, on Sarah is this um, uh, caricature of the French invasion of Holland, which represents um, a maypole, a liberty tree being uh, planted in uh, Amsterdam following the French invasion of Holland. And you can see uh, Dutch men and, and women dancing around uh, around it and um, uh, aping with um, a monkey, so uh, literally uh, aping the, uh, the French. This is a representation of the, uh, of the Carmagnol, the, uh, the round dance. Um, conversely, uh, this is another, uh, the last slide I'm, I'm, I'm going to show. Uh, Suvarov giving the French directory a taste of the nouds. Uh, it represents the uh, Russian, uh, the Russians uh, frogging or uh, whipping uh, Frenchmen. So uh, following Russian successes in uh, northern Italy, uh, you can see all the different uh, French revolutionary symbols, Tree of Liberty, uh, cockade, uh, tricolor feathers, etc. And the Russian general says, um, this is the dance of la Carmagnole. So here you have a kind of fantasy of, um, of French defeat using the a kind of counter Carmagnole. So uh, there's evidence that Syria was sung in the English and uh, Scottish uh, plebeian societies that spread uh, rapidly after the publication of the second part of Thomas Paine's Rights of Man from early 1792. The radical milieu was instrumental in uh, publishing and spreading versions of Sarah in various forms. For instance, in the Patriots calendar for the year 1795, you can see three pages, Sarah on the left, La Carmagnole in the middle, and the Marche des Marseillois, which is of course the um, Marseillaise on the right. Um, so radical publishers uh, published the songs as slips and among collections. But Saira was never hegemonic. Um, sometimes you can hear that it was a kind of uh, anthem, a kind of radical anthem, but it, it, was never, uh, it was never so. It was always in competition with many other songs. And radicals tended to subvert established English songs. They tended to write parodies of God Save the King, rather than try to impose new French tunes. And oddly enough, Sarah was never really translated. I never found uh, uh, a very good translation, probably because Sarah is difficult to translate. You have, uh, it will go, it will go fine, it will be fine, but it, it, it never works. Anyway, the metric ne never works in, in English. I'll say it's only four syllables. So the, the burden 
never really took in, in English. So I suspect that the tune would be known, but the actual lyrics would not be. For this matter of translation, and also because the lyrics changed and there were always different, uh, different versions in, in competition. So it was best to parody God Save the King. It was safest because everyone knew the tune of, of God Save the King rather than uh, try to impose new French songs. Um, Saira was also part of the new uh, radical phraseology um, of the London Correspondent Society and, and other societies. So they adopted new French forms and styles. So I've, I've used this uh, cloud to, to show some of the expressions that they used uh, during, their, um, during their meetings, uh, the sittings, uh, natural rights, uh, a British convention, the uh, republic is, indiv in, is indivis indivisible, uh, patriotic donations will be sought, uh, the honours of citizenship will be granted, etc. And so um, some of some of the reports, at least one Scottish report from December 1793, was dated first year of the British Convention, one and, indiv and indivisible, a very French phrase, with the addition of Seira, Seira. So they would write Seira, Seira in the margins. The government took a stern view, of course, of such French uh, uh, phraseology and uh, prosecution. Um, the prosecution brought, brought up Seira as evidence in state trials in 1794. In particular, a seal with the word Seira uh, was found on the persons of Thomas Muir, a leader of the uh, Scottish radicals, and this was, uh, of course, used in the bill of, of indictment as um, evidence of um, treason and uh, attempts at uh, subversion. So conservative or loyalist uh, reactions had become extreme. Um, they started by uh, dismissing um, the song in 1790, so, uh, and, but by 1793, tropes of monstrosity, madness and savagery had become uh, prevalent. To give just one example, an, an article from the Observer in the autumn of 1792, an, old, an, an anecdote about an old Swiss gentleman incurred the fury of the mob who burnt his house down with their pikes the sanguinary monsters pinned him there and insultingly demanding him to sa sing Saira, danced around the fire singing themselves, singing themselves sorry, in the true spirit of North American savages. So here you can see that Sarah serves as, as, as a way to uh, humiliate uh, other people in, in, in public and the, um, those sans culottes are dehumanized as North American uh, savages. So this became uh, a, a staple of uh, anti-Jacobin writing. In the late 1790s, Sarah and the Carmagnola are very often mentioned in satirical contexts uh, rather, but they were not really parodied because there were no lyrics to be parodied. And if you want to parody something, you have, you need an original that is stable enough um, to be recognized through the parody. But, but for lack of that, they would not write a, a, a parody of the um, of of Sarah or, or the Carmagnol. Uh, Edmund Burke, who is um, perhaps the most famous conservative of the time, but somewhat idiosyncratic uh, 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 politician uh, mentioned Saira twice, at, at least I've searched the, the full text of his uh, complete works. In, um, in, in 1719, the first occurrence, he, he answers um, um, Foxite Whig uh, by telling him, uh, I could sing you Saira in the sense of nonsense, tosh, um, but later, in 1796, he imagines burning property deeds to the tune of Sarah. And again, uh, answering another um, lord, uh, a Whig uh, lord, the Duke of Bedford, he tells them uh, that in case of a French invasion, they will laugh, indeed, they will laugh, they will laugh at his part parchment and his wax. 
His deeds will be drawn out with the rest of the lumber of his evidence room and burnt to the tune of Sarah in the courts of Bedford, then Equality House. So Sarah became the, becomes the song for a kind of fantasy riot with English sans-culottes burning down English castles and country houses and deeds of property, as the French had done in 1789. Um, okay, my, my, my second part, more, more quickly, uh, uh, about the, the um, uh, pragmatic, um, pragmatic dimension of Sarah doing things with a tune thinking and threatening. So my, my main point here is that Sarah w was heard only very rarely, very intermittently, because it was forbidden, and so the people who sang the song, who whistled the tune, uh, did it for strategic purposes uh, always, and it, it, and it was a victory to be able to sing it on the streets. So it was um, a threat uh, and the song was used as a, as a threat because it was sung without the um, lyrics or because it was played by a band. It was more difficult to indict it. So it was a way of saying things without actually saying them or threatening people with, with, with death and revolution without actually calling to arms and to a revolution. So um, there's... There's a lot of historiography in the constitutionalist idiom, uh, with the idea that the radicals use the constitutionalist idiom, uh, that they use the English constitution, the Magna Carta, the um, British constitution, etc., because they feared that they might be accused of uh, being traitors if they used the French Revolution. But I argue that the French revolutionary symbols were still used uh, lack the cap of liberty and lack the songs. And I would suggest that Sarah, the cap of liberty and other symbols, had a kind of thermostatic function, turning, turning the heat up or down. So you would sing Sarah to put pressure to bear on the authorities to turn heat, to threaten them with revolution, and you refrained from singing Sarah when you wanted to... Uh, when you wanted to sound uh, respectable and, and constitutional. So this is why there was a, a strategic use of, the, um, of those songs, and the Carmenial as well. Um, so just one slide to, to illustrate this about the Peterloo Massacre of um, the 16th of August, uh, 1819, a peaceful radical rally which was... Um, uh, where uh, uh, men, women, and children were massacred by the Manchester Yeomanry, um, uh, a turning point in, uh, in the history of democracy in Britain. So Barnes, interestingly, Barnes did not play Sarah uh, at Peterloo on St. Peter's Fields, but they played it at dinners, at public dinners, before and after. And so my hypothesis is that the organizers wanted the meeting to be respectable and constitutional, which is why they did not play Sarah, but they vented threats at dinners before and in smaller scale um, events. So there was a careful poisons of threats. This is uh, at least where my uh, reflections uh, led me. Um, perhaps a, f a few words on uh, Carlyle and, and, and Dickens to, to finish. Um, and, and now I'm entering more uh, resolutely into literary uh, territory. Um, uh, Thomas Carlyle's uh, History of the French Revolution, uh, published in uh, 1837 presents vivid scenes of uh, desecration um, set in 1793 during the um, uh, de-Christianization uh, campaigns. Of course, the French Revolution receded into uh, history. There was a selective memory of songs. Uh, Carlyle was... Um, um, uh, he was... 
professional enough to ask for a copy of Saira. He wanted the score of, of, of the song, which I find interesting because this suggests both that uh, Carlyle was serious and, and wanted to see the song and perhaps play it. So, at, well, at the French Revolution receded into history, there was a selective uh, memory of songs. Um, and in, uh, in, in Carlyle, um, so Carlyle, uh, interestingly, had to, well, ask for a score of uh, Seira to, um, to peruse it, which suggests two things. First, that he was um, professional enough as a historian to want, the, um, to want the evidence and the source material. Secondly, that the song was not widely known among uh, middle-class men in the 1830s. They, they, they had perhaps for, forgotten about, uh, about it. At least it was not common uh, knowledge. In part three, book five, uh, chapter four, entitled uh, Carmagnol uh, uh, Complete, um, uh, uh, Carlyle um, presents the uh, dechristianization campaigns led by the uh, Montagnard scenes of demonic Eucharist and uh, dance, uh, and dance uh, macabre. So again, a rather long uh, quotation, but I've highlighted in, in red the um, references to uh, Sarah and the, uh, and the Carmagnol. Um, they are, this is similar, in a way, to tropes of madness and intoxication that were used in the loyalist press of the 1790s to account for uh, seemingly aberrant behavior. Um, but uh, here, I, I, I think there's, there's, a more, uh, there's a more prophetic, uh, uh, more prophetic characterization of the uh, of the revolution here. Uh, the role of um, the role of women um, is also uh, is also important. We see them as abandoned women or as prostitutes, given the domestic ideology. Uh, dominant in England, which only adds to the uh, to the transgression. Uh, this is a Carmagnol jacket. This is uh, because actually Car Carlyle's chapter Carmagnol Complete is named after the um, after the jacket, not just uh, not just the dance. Uh, so in 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 Carmagnol Complete, um, Carlyle. Um, shows the Carmagnol as a kind of, uh, well, it takes on a gothic character. It's a symptom of a deeply sick society and a portent, an omen of horrors to, uh, to come. Carlyle was preoccupied with um, crowd control and uh, he understood that crowds in the French Revolution were moved by hunger, as, as were crowds in his own times with Chartism. Uh, and he felt that the French elites had failed to channel popular anger into, uh, into order. They'd failed to turn chaos into order. So the French Revolution uh, by, by Carlyle was a warning, a warning call uh, to the Victorian elite to exercise active uh, social uh, leadership. Otherwise, society sunk into scenes of, uh, of sacrilege and, uh, and horror. In, uh, as for Dickens, uh, I'm, I am much indebted to um, um, uh, Natalie's uh, aggregation course, thank you very much, for all those perspectives on, uh, <laughs> on uh, A Tale of Two Cities. I, I, have, I haven't done uh, a full reading on, on, on Dickens and, and on this, but I've, uh, I've, I've read uh, apparently that um, a, a, a Tale of, of Two Cities prompted um, uh, a fashion for the Carmagnol, the song was reissued as a score uh, because of a musical that was um, performed in, in London, so inspired by the, uh, by the book, and then uh, people, uh, people could play the harpsichord, presumably on the pianoforte, no longer a, a harpsichord, uh, but, but this time more in a, in, in, in a gothic retro uh, way. 
So uh, Dickens's own uh, evocation of the Carmagnol is re revealing uh, of the way uh, such a dance was reviled and represented the darker and utterly unrespectable side of the French Revolution. But beyond that, uh, it was the irrational forces unleashed by bodies dancing. As Mark Philp commented, Dickens recognizes that the dance controlled the bodies of those engaged and by mobilizing and controlling it unleashes deeper, more irrational forces. So Dickens' representation goes beyond loyalist tro tropes stating that Carmonious uh, dancers must be mad or, or drunk. But it's significant that he should have uh, chosen this dance to figure the dark force of uh, instincts. And this is due perhaps to the dissociation between, uh, that I told you about between the Marseillaise as the respectable and even lofty song and the degraded abjects uh, Carmagnol. Indeed, Dickens' position was rather liberal. His novel was to warn the British ruling elites not to commit the mistakes the French aristocracy did before 1789, but to listen to the people's demands as expressed uh, by the Chartists. So the revolution of 1789 then was a um, historic necessity and it was good insofar as it brought down the uh, hateful Ancien Regime. The Carmagnol becomes an allegory of the disjointed times and, and the terrifying power of the masses. It serves to, to warn against the risk that the masses might wrest control of socio-political change. And I think there's a vignette effect in this scene by Dickens as well, but I suppose that it's not as well contained as in Williams. In Williams it's, it's pretty and beautiful, but in Dickens, writing about 1793 and with the knowledge of what went after, uh, this kind of, of, of vignette of, of the Carmagnol is, uh, ca cannot remain uh, confined within a single scene. Um, Dickens' stance could be called Girondin, I think, uh, and this may have to do with uh, Lamartine. I, I, I've done my, my research on Lamartine, though. So Lamartine, the uh, French poet, had published his own history of the Girondists in 1847, just before the Revolution. And it was a, a history of the French Revolution that was very popular in Britain. Lamartine, at some point, called Seyra that Marseillaise of assassins, uh, in the course of um, description of a demonstration headed by a female uh, Democrat and feminist, Desoigne de Méricourt. And each time Sarah and the Carmagnol appear in his history, it's in a narrative of riots involving women at the forefront with humiliation, violence, and pillage. And so I suspect that such scenes from the pen of a respected, successful French poet might have influenced the English uh, public and strengthen the association of the two songs with transgression. Dickens certainly praised Lamartine uh, in, a, in a letter from March 1848, so during the French Revolution of 1848, he called him one of the best fellows in the world, which uh, does not mean that he was inspired by, uh, by Lamartine, but I would suggest that there was an alignment between um, between the two, and a kind of dissociation between 1789 and 1793 with the Carmagnol and Seyra, the abject, unredeemable part of the revolution. Um, so my concluding words, I'm not going to say anything more about vignettes, uh, I think I'm, I'm done with that, but perhaps to ask where the power of uh, frightening, where, where does Seyra's frightening power come from? Of course, from historical associations and contexts, from the massacres of 1793, the terror. But uh, I think it, it also has to do with the title, with the melody, and with the tune. Uh, perhaps because the title expresses optimism, so it can be seen as revolutionary confidence, but also as desperate recklessness, okay? Uh, kind of res recklessness, we can pull it off. Uh, anything goes, perhaps be because the melody as well uh, is the simplicity of the tune makes it endearing, it has a relatively high, high pitch, but this is in contrast 
with the deadly words applied from 1791. So I would suggest that there was something eerie that lent itself to the Gothic, perhaps, in the contrast between hanging people by the lamppost and the, this kind of, um, of uh, nice tune, the simplicity of, of, of the tune. So beyond words, the oral dimension, and here I'm, I'm really stepping into a, a, a speculative dimension that you might want to, uh, to comment on, uh, with the idea that revolutionary songs unleashed primeval uh, animal energies because of their tune and their beat and the music, not the lyrics, because as we saw, the lyrics were almost irrelevant from the start. So not the lyrics, but the, the, but the tune. And uh, finally, the, the idea that there was a popular violence that was difficult to channel, that it was resurgent, and that each time you heard someone whistling Saira or the Carmagnol, then it meant that there was something uh, that was surging up, and that it was the elite's responsibility to channel that into um, respectability. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your attention. Thank you, Rémi. Great. Um, that was very interesting. Uh, I think we're going to have a debate. Uh, we can take some questions from uh, here and from the people who are yeah. at home. Can we not? Yeah. Yes. Shall I, shall I take down the PowerPoint or, if you want or perhaps yes, if, you if we want to we'll go back to some slides, whatever. Yeah. We can do this and we can see the other one. Yeah, that's probably easier. Um, right, uh, is there anyone who would like to start or, or can I open the questions? Uh, I would just like to ask Rémi about the similar British songs because you mentioned the Saira mm -hmm. and La Carmagnole and I was wondering whether other songs in Britain have the same um, power. You talked about the thermostatic function of uh, you know, putting pressure on the elites. So would there be, run at the same time, would there be songs that have the same, the same power and the same function in Britain? No, 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 no I don't think so. Okay. No British songs because uh, I I read um, in the Northern Star I, I think a, a chartist writing in eighteen in the mid eighteen forties saying there is no radical Marseillaise in in England so there was no no single tune that could have this this function actually the radicals um, composed a lot of songs but many of them were to the tune of so you have, for instance, God Save the Rights of Man, which is to the tune of the rights of man, but they, or they would compose to the tune of Rule Britannia, um, of, of lots of songs. So I, I think what, what happened was that it, it was more of a contest for the appropriation of tunes that existed and were already popular, and the Conservatives won because they managed to, um, to erase they managed to suppress the uh, radical <coughs> revolutionary versions and to impose okay. conservative lyrics. All right. And uh, so I so parodies on parodies. Yes, yes, and, and 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 I think there were few radical tunes. It would be difficult to find one. Either there were too few, or there were too many, and they cancelled each other out. But n none of them really emerged as the the song. Yeah, something as symbolical as. No, no, I, I can't think of, of, of any, but... Um. Okay, have we got questions um, wherever you are? <laughs> yes, um, Trevor? Uh, just a brief comment. Thank you very much, Remy. Thank you very much indeed for a fascinating book. It's, it's very, very interesting to see how um, something like this kind of percolates through so many different aspects of the political culture of, um, of the period you're talking about, which is not one I know um, particularly well. Um, presumably fears uh, raised by this kind of activity and by the, um, the, the, 
a sort of intermedial power of, of uh, the songs and so on that you are talking about reached quite a long way forward in France. I mean, I'm thinking about people like Ten and, and Le Bon later in the 19th century. I'm just wondering whether they ever kind of mentioned these things. Um, in Britain, there's an interesting parallel with uh, something I was working on a few weeks ago in, uh, in a completely different context. Uh, the V for Victory campaign during the Second World War in Britain, where the, the opening bars of um, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony were used constantly to uh, da -da -da -da, to, to represent the letter V and to kind of generate a, a, a very widespread campaign uh, in Britain uh, against Germany, but also in France, occupied France. Um, it's only a small example, but it just made me think of that. Um, I suppose there is just one question. Was Saïra or La Carmagnole, were they ever, did they ever crop up at all during the debates um, at the time of the Great Reform Act in 32? I mean, you talked about 48, which I can understand. Perhaps they didn't. Um, or perhaps you haven't looked into that. If you haven't, I'm sorry. But uh, I just wondered. I've, I've done some work on 1832, but I never came across any references to this. I, I don't know, honestly. I, I haven't but, looked at, the, at those years uh, very much, but... <laughs> I don't know, because the, the French Revolution of, of 1830 was very pacific, in a way. It was very short, it mm. lasted for three days, there were few mm. casualties, so, mm. uh, so that was a moment when the idea of revolution was becoming more acceptable, you know, that, that France had uh, proved that it was able to manage regime, regime change without uh, decades of, of bloodshed and, and, and all of that. So uh, yeah. I don't think the, I don't think it would make much sense for the radicals to play uh, Seira or the Carmagnol at, at that moment because they were egging on the Whigs to pass the reform bills, and they were nearly there, so they would be rather more encouraging, uh, rather than uh, than trying to frighten them. It would have been counterproductive. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? Yes, uh, if I may. This is Beatrice. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, Remy, for this uh, very interesting talk. I was, uh, uh, yes, curious to see how the, um, the, these two songs, Carmagnol and Seira, were recuperated and circulated uh, among different uh, political groups. And you mentioned that it, it was even sung in Wick. Uh, in Whig circles, which I, I find very interesting because, of course, when um, it was recuperated and apparently it had become almost unknown uh, in uh, Carlyle's writing, he had to do some research to, to find the lyrics. Mm -hmm. Much later, I found, for example, in Mayhew, uh, you know, um, in Mayhew's uh, London Labour and the London Poor. There is a, a reference in book one to uh, the songs, well, to all sorts of patriotic songs being uh, sung in pubs. And apparently among the working classes, they, they still were widely known and, uh, and, and sung. Uh, these people obviously wouldn't have been Whigs. So I, I was interested in seeing how um, the same song could be appropriated mm. and circulated among different uh, sort of uh, interest in political parties. <laughs> Maybe you would like to expand on that. Yes, I've, I've often wondered who would know the tune. Um, nobody would know the lyrics, but who would recognize the tune as something revolutionary and dangerous and grave? Uh, and I don't know. I, I, I suppose that workers in uh, textile factories in Lancashire, you know, at the time of Peterloo and after, they would know. So there would be some, some areas, some constituencies that would know. But, um, yes, the, the, sometimes it, 
it, it, it feels as if everyone knows the tag uh, Sarah, everyone knows that there's a song uh, that, that's called Sarah and that it is dangerous and you must not sing it but, but how many people would actually know the tune uh, I, I don't know it's, it, it's difficult to it's difficult to say actually but there's, there's a way of, 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 of looking at it which, which I haven't done uh, you should look at songsters uh, and you have uh, radical songsters and in, in the late uh, 19th century Paul Pickering has, uh, has looked at them and at the way uh, that at, at all the, the variants and the versions of God Save the King that you can find in radical songsters in the 1870s, 80s, 90s, etc. So it would be interesting to see if, if, if the songs are, uh, are, 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 are mentioned there. But, but you have some some traces uh, here and there. there's the, there's an American novel called Sarah uh, from the 1870s or 80s I think uh, which might be an, a kind of uh, uh, isolated uh, <laughs> instance no I, I don't know if, if that's well known at all but I, I found that on a, on a database so Never heard of yeah that, sorry. <laughs> no I, I, I wouldn't expect you to so um, Yes, the, the, the Whigs would be, uh, I think that would be a very small group of Whigs in the, in the early 1790s. And, um, but more, yes, but more research would be in order to, 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 to really determine what the, what the song meant and what kind of people used it as a weapon. You know, I'm, I'm fairly sure about what I said about the, thermostatic function and, and, and frightening the bourgeois and, and all of that. But, but I need more, more example to, uh, to see how that, how that worked really. Because you, you have some instances of dinners where they, they would, they would uh, drink the king's health and then they would play Rule Britannia and then Sarah and then the Marseillaise and then um, say uh, uh, yes, Britain strike home or this kind of, of imperialist song. So it's uh, so so they didn't see any any any, any contradiction. So we so we have to sort of reconstruct their, their mindset. Me too. That's strange. Yes, it is. Just enjoying the music. <laughs> <laughs> yes, just enjoy the music. Yes, you. Yes. <laughs> oh, uh, Helen. Speak, Helen uh, Helen Gethel. Hello, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, my question concerns the, the Carmagnole, that's to say the dance. I was wondering whether that dance, um, well, a study of that dance could be related to studies about um, May Day celebrations, dancing around the maple, because it seems to me that that could be a way that the, the British could uh, domesticate the, the original French dance, and perhaps the dancers could use it more subversively. I don't know, it's just an, uh, uh, an idea. Oh. Yeah, submit to your wisdom. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the, the, yeah that, that would be interesting. But, but, but I think that the, the May Day itself was borrowed from, uh, like the Americans already had the Trees of Liberty during the American Revolution, which, which again went back probably to, 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 to earlier, uh, to earlier forms. Um, yeah, I, I don't know about the uh, about the Carmagnol really because I've I've been looking for it on on YouTube and and found no no satisfactory. Um, uh, uh, video to, to, to show, because there, there, there's also a very regional aspect. You can also find the Occitan Carmagnol with people in places like Perpignan or Narbonne with the uh, Occitan flag 
and dancing the Carmagnol. So this is not the same tune, but this is more or less the same dance. Mm -hmm. So it's so it's strange to see that the that the dance has been you know re recuperated in, in in a kind of uh, uh, regional regionalism, uh, which to me is not politically aligned mm -hmm. with. Uh, 1793 at all it, it, it tends to be quite the quite the contrary so uh, I, I don't know because uh, I, I think there was this uh, struggle over appropriation as uh, as I told you a little bit about the songs like, like God, God Save the King but knowing the English loyalists uh, I, I think they would be very good at uh, appropriating May dancing for loyalists purposes, you know, as uh, communion with nature, nature being religion, religion being obedience to the king, and that kind of thing. So I, I, I suppose there, there would be a, a kind of, um, of, of conflict there that the radicals might very well lose, uh, except, in, except in some places. But Yeah, thank you for your question. And Mathilde, Mathilde, do you have a microphone or? We can't hear you very well, Mathilde. Sorry. Is there is a way of, I don't know, getting closer. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, yeah, just gave a comment here. It reminded me of a, a song that is uh, actually comes with a dance in, in, in Sweden, and it's it's a heart back to the French occupation of Sweden, and it's called the little frog, and they hop around the maple, uh, but in in a, in a way that parody or mocks the French, in fact. So it's just... Yeah. Um, in fact, I had a question. Um, I'm not. Uh, I would like to know, uh, Remy, if you if you have come across, um, you know, revolutionary songs from from the U.S. from the United States that travelled to Britain that, that may have been appropriated there, or is there something similar across uh, across the uh, I do not know. Honestly, no. I, I found mentions of Yankee Doodle, but in other songs, mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, there's a loyalist song in in Britain in the 1790s that says the American have their Yankee Doodle, the French have their Syrah, but we have our uh, God Save the King or, or whatever. So um, yeah, so they knew about Yankee Doodle, but I'm I'm not sure they. They they sang it, but they, they 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 appropriated things from the American Revolution, like no taxation without representation, uh, and and some ideology, of course, republicanism and and the like. But I I don't know about about any song, honestly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mathilde, do you have a Anyone like to ask a question? Because if not, I think we can maybe um, thank Remy again for a very nice presentation. Thank you.